All right. Uh, welcome to Chapter 4. We're going to be uh, covering eukaryotic cells and microorganisms. And it truly comes down to the interaction between these two types. Uh, that's really what disease is. Now that we have some of that uh, understanding under our belts, I think it uh, will make this chapter a little bit more interesting for you. At least I hope you agree. Um, I've done this sort of uh, pattern in terms of what chapters and things. Uh, this will be about the uh, third year for doing that. And uh, it seems to have worked well. So we'll, uh, we'll push on. I hope everyone's had a chance to view the uh, Inner Life of the Cell video. Uh, this was done by Zivo uh, in con conjunction with uh, the uh, Harvard University uh, project that they had. Uh, it's it's a uh, very good project uh, that uh, that uh, took I guess uh, four years in the making, uh, and it's still under underway. They have a lot more videos, and I will. Uh, bring those out uh, on due course. They're mostly eukaryotic oriented. Um, uh, Zyvo, uh, the company that's in uh, Baltimore, they have done a series of a really, really good uh, uh, graphical uh, basis of how biology works and uh, biomedical videos. And uh, they're really, really good. In fact, I was so enamored by it, I invited uh, the CEO down uh, to give a talk at uh, Wake Tech. This was years ago. And uh, it, it went very well. I had a competition, a model building competition at the time, and, and it was, uh, was judged uh, by the CEO. And it was a really good experience. I've really gotten to uh, like having uh, that uh, really high tech uh, biomedical uh, animation uh, as a way. I think that's the future for communicating what biology is and how it works. So uh, I hope you'll indulge me as I try to incorporate some of those things. Uh, so we're going to talk about bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotic cells. It's sort of the uh, continuation of the previous chapter, but we're going into more eukaryotic type of uh, discussions and the organisms that uh, can cause the disease on the eukaryotic size. And we'll look at that. So now I wasn't there two to three billion years ago, so I can't vouch for it, but uh, they, the first eukaryotic cells seem to appear, at least uh, carbon dating has, has said that. Bacteria, archaea, and eukarya all evolved from the last common ancestor, at least that's what we believe. Who knows? Uh, there's some theorists that think that a uh, unidentified flying object flew over the earth somewhere and dumped their toilet, and here we are. That was a joke. It, uh, I don't think there's anyone that seriously believes that, but if they are, um, interesting. Uh, first primitive eukaryotes were likely single cell and independent well that would make sense it's simpler first over time cells aggregated forming colonies and then the colonies you would imagine would become more specialized and more complex into multicellular type of organisms as they uh, evolve from the individual cells and then they lost their ability to survive separately because they work. See, th this is where the concept of biofilms kind of weaves its way through about everything, if you look at it that way. Uh, the transition from single cell to complex multicellular organisms uh, really uh, come by, I think, in, a, uh, uh, in such a way that... Uh, um, it's the uh, synergistic effect of multiple types of organisms and uh, I just wanted you to kind of think of it that way and that's why I'm pushing the biofilm concept because if you have that understanding as a as a sort of a uh, in the medical profession as a practitioner you uh, have more of an appreciation about uh, what you're seeing and the interactions of humans and the like so let's look at which of the following characteristics is evidence for mitochondria were once prokaryotic cells. And I had touched upon this in the last uh, 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 chapter. 
and the mitochondria uh, uh, does it have because of the circular chromosome does it have prokaryotic ribosomes capable of independent division and membranes that can be inhibited by antibiotics and or E all of them are correct well E would be the right uh, answer because all of these things are characteristics of uh, the mitochondria which are uh, conflicting uh, what's in uh, our eukaryotic cells. The prokaryotic of course is 70S ribosome versus 80S uh, remember S being Seberg units, and that's just migration through a polyacrylamide gel, uh, separating proteins by charge and size. Uh, capable of independent division, uh, that they go by their own, uh, of course, just like bacteria. Uh, interestingly, I'll just add the point, um, if you want to lose weight, uh, one of the things you can do, of course, is to build muscle mass. And what that does is causes more of the mitochondria uh, to start replicating and increase in numbers. And I always liken it to um, a idling diesel engine. Uh, the more of these uh, mitochondria that are uh, around to service for power and energy production, it burns energy to do that it, uh, in the form of ATP. And we're going to talk about how that forms. But um, it's a capable. Uh, as a standpoint is if weight loss the more you have idling the more of the fuel they're going to burn so if you have more muscle mass you're going to be burning more energy uh, or fat just the fact that the muscle tissue is there is just something to uh, think about a lot of this stuff has a direct translation as we go into uh, how it's applied so um, so I don't know. Did I say the answer was E? All of these are correct. Uh, that would be the, the right answer. Uh, so we're also going to look at now differentiating amongst uh, the flagellar structures of bacteria, eukaryotes, and archaea. Now I've already kind of given away the party as far as how the uh, flagella actually uh, do their their bidding uh, in, as far as uh, spinning and uh, moving towards and away from uh, various uh, sugars and uh, repellents and things like that which are important we need to know that and uh, to understand that these are relationships that are really really important to the bacteria maybe not so much to us because uh, we have more complex ways I mean we dial call up uh, Domino's pizza and just order pizza but uh, the bacteria have to sense where it is and go for it and using it so we're going to talk about uh, similarities and differences between eukaryotic and bacteria cytoplasmic membranes discuss the main structural components of the nucleus and then di diagram how the nucleus endoplasmic reticulum golgi all these things work together on the eukaryotic side uh, in a complex way and again taking in the concept of having this 3d uh, view of what's going on is so much better than a 2d view uh, so and then we're going to talk more about the mitochondria and of course how the ribosomes work and how the differences are talk about the three main fibers of the cytoskeleton and then talk about this amazing concept of the endosymbiosis which I've already spilled the beans on which means uh, life forms uh, uh, through a process of coming together uh, inside so endosymbiosis contributed to the development of eukaryotic cells very very interesting so here's a structure of a eukaryotic cell um, if you look at uh, one aspect of a, uh, a fibrous type of material like flagellas or cilia, uh, uh, the idea I wanted you to think about is, is microtubules arranged in such a way. We have nine such configurations with two in the center and this makes up uh, sort of a strand or fiber uh, of material and this is of course uh, within eukaryotic cells and so eukaryotic flagella so, so like the tail of a sperm cell will have a flagella that has uh, 
uh, these types of structures, the uh, networking of, of this uh, uh, microtubules, but uh, different from bacteria flagella, thicker by a factor of 10. So they're really uh, much bigger, which we can imagine, structurally more complex, yes, covered by extension of the cell membrane, long sheath cylindrical or cylinder uh, containing a regular space microtubules. So microtubules are sort of the, the components. Every time we start to see these macrostructures, they are made up of microstructures. And it's, it's that understanding that helps us uh, appreciate uh, the complexity of nature. Uh, eukaryotic cilia, similar to flagella in structure, but are smaller and more numerous, which makes sense, uh, found only in a single group of protozoa in certain animal cells. The glycocalyx, the outermost layer that comes in direct contact with the environment, is composed of polysaccharides. We've already talked about the glycocalyx. A uh, network of fibers, the slime layer and capsule, contributes to the protection, adherence, and signal reception. And so we're going to um, talk about well, what signal reception is it picking up FM radio or TV or something? Uh, we'll get back to that here in a sec. So the boundary structure is the cell wall. The protozoa and helminths do not have cell walls. Cell walls of fungi, if you think of it, uh, just remember the last time you had to clean the shower. Uh, you, you know, things are growing around the floor and uh, surviving in such uh, these environments. Uh, they're pretty uh, tough. So rigid and provide structural support and shape uh, for the cell wall. Different in chemical composition from bacteria and archaea, uh, uh, kale, uh, archaeal uh, cell walls. I always uh, have that uh, stutter on that one. A thick inner layer of polysaccharide fibers composed of chitin or chitin. That's depending on um, uh, how you want to say it. More like uh, Greek would be chitin uh, or cellulose, which is a type uh, we know about fingernails and things like that, or cellulose at uh, grasses and things like that. Uh, a thin outer layer of mixed glycans. And so and how they're linked is the key to having a beta type link. So the cell wall is tough and rigid. So you have these mixed glycans, the glycoproteins, this chitin, this, this really strong type of material in cell membrane. So this is uh, sort of a, a view of the, the fungi. And uh, you can imagine that it they're a totally different class of antibiotics if we want to try to get through all that. And really, we only have three or four that we use consistently uh, to go after these fungi. But this is the reason why they're so tough, is uh, the cell wall. And we'll come back to that. So the typical bilayer of phospholipids in which protein molecules are embedded. So it is more characteristically embedded with proteins than we see in bacteria or archaea cells. Contains sterile, sterols, which are steroids of various types that just like any type of sterile uh, will add rigidity. It's, it's sort of like adding, um, you have cholesterol, which it's sort of like adding glass or panes of glass to a membrane. It makes it a little bit more rigid, more stable, so it's not as, you know, the phospholipids kind of float like you were seeing in that video, uh, the inner life of the cell. Things are more dynamic, more interactive, and cholesterol either allows these lipid rafts of things that are associated that migrate together, so you could have proteins and various uh, things together held together on a raft using the sterols, and so you have like function things kind of uh, convalescing together and they float around and I don't know if you picked that up in the movie but they had some examples of that really important so this kind of the sorts of things that happen with that important in cells that do not have cell walls so um, the cytoplasmic membrane serve as selectively permeable barriers well that's true for pretty much any of the cytoplasmic membranes for anything really uh, in the nucleus is the most prominent organelle, which you would think, uh, eukaryotic cells, because hence where all the programming lives for the cell and all the, the uh, features that uh, are reproducible and uh, are uh, actually uh, 
uh, sort of uh, the programs executed so things are made uh, so they're uh, created that way so separate from cell cytoplasm by an external boundary called a nuclear envelope so an envelope like you send anything in an envelope kind of you can seal it and protect it and do that sort of thing you can mail it and that sort of the nuclear envelope is uh, just that it's a protective it's composed of two parallel membranes now this is a common thing that's overlooked it's not a single membrane it's it's two parallel membranes they're sort of uh, 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 closed itself like uh, those packages that we send that are uh, have bubble wrap and we actually put things inside that but uh, the membrane is actually like two layers of that uh, bubble wrap um, by that, that narrow space uh, perforated with small regular shaped pores so we can move things in and out uh, the pores are the portals that we can move uh, the messenger RNA out of the or uh, proteins depending on where the ribosomes are uh, forms of sites where membranes unite. Macromolecules migrate through the pores to the cytoplasm and vice versa. So uh, you have more uh, uh, important things like uh, messenger RNA and that sort of thing. Um, nucleolus, which I view that as the uh, sort of the CFO of the cell, found in the nucleoplasm, uh, site for ribosomal RNA synthesis, and a collection area for ribosomal sub, uh, subunits. But if you're controlling the flow of the money and how things are spent, uh, sort of what a CFO does, then you control the RNA synthesis because from the RNA, all the proteins are made. So if you can control the timing of this, uh, hence you know that uh, you're running the system. And that's why I kind of equate the nucleolus, misnucleolus is what I refer to in my analogy of the cell business analogy uh, see where he runs the business in terms of uh, taking care of the finances which this is an expensive thing for any cell is really directing uh, protein synthesis you think of it RNA only exists for about two to three weeks in the eukaryotic cell and then it self destructs and you can't really expect it to last much longer than that it is single stranded and so uh, you're constantly remaking that and sending out uh, new ones uh, or new uh, designs to be made, which allows us to do that. Chromatin is made up of linear DNA and histone proteins. And so the way the nucleus is packed, it, instead of big circular peas like we see with uh, bacteria, uh, the eukaryotes have a much bigger problem. And we have to systematically pack it in 23 pairs and we roll it up with histones and these proteins just allow it to be packed in a more orderly fashion and if we didn't then it would probably look like my desk and that'd be a mess um, and so the nucleus you can see here's the artistic rendition and seeing the the double sort of uh, bilayer type of construction that you know like that package of bubble wrap the inside the inside would be here the outside of the bubble wrap but it's it's the configuration that makes this uh, uh, outer membrane of the nucleus really unique and then it's uh, marbled with these uh, nuclear pores throughout and that's what allows Miss Nucleolus's office is in the inside and directing all that. Now attached, of course, to the nucleus is the manufacturing floor. And then it's studded with, you know, the rough ER, which is studded with the ribosomes, as you can see those little blue things. And there's a lot of noise. You can kind of view it in a, in a uh, business analogy of sparks flying with welders and a lot of folks there that uh, have hard hats and uh, just doing the work well that's where we're building it so the instructions are sent through the, the nuclear pores and then it goes out to the shop floor to be built and that's kind of what I view the endoplasmic reticulum now all that means these are rooms a uh, reticulum is a fancy word a, a Latin word and it just means uh, really a series of rooms and that are within the plasmic area of course right outside of the nucleus so this is sitting out in the milieu of the cell and of course all of the proteins are being made and sent around and 
various things. The shipping department's not too far from here, the Golgi apparatus, so you can see that uh, we keep things kind of in a smart location. But uh, as we go through, so a series of membrane tunnels used for transport and storage. So the reticulum, the series of rooms that are on the inside or that uh, move within the plasma of the cell, but it, in these specialized rooms, allow transport of materials from the nucleus to the cytoplasm and to the cell's exterior. The ribosomes. Uh, attached to the membrane surface and they act like little 3D printers that have the information coming from the messenger RNA and then we'll talk a little bit more about that. The smooth ER is a little bit different. This is loud and boisterous, the rough ER. You know, as I say, a lot of the shops going on. The smooth is much, it is closed tubular network without ribosomes, so we don't have the active building. We have nutrient processing and synthesis, storage, and non-protein macromolecules such as lipids. And then some post-processing of the proteins occur here, sort of like adding flame retardant to a couch or something. A couch would be built in the uh, rough ER and then goes uh, into the smooth for refinement and some other special touches as my analogy kind of unfolds there. So there's the ribosomes uh, studded with those sorts of things. And these little spaces, I think I've already alluded to, uh, allow for the transfer RNAs to come in. And a transfer RNA, uh, which we'll see here in a little while, uh, has a, an amino acid attached to it with a specific anti-codon sequence. So they're unique. Uh, so they, if you have a particular grouplet of three uh, nucleotides that um, uh, will encode sort of the decoder ring aspect. So it matches the codon of the messenger RNA. So it decodes in groups of three, which amino acid goes onto the, uh, the necklace that's being made, or the, the string of amino acids that we now call a protein. And so this process, now we're not seeing that detail of the transfer RNAs, I'm just saying where they go. And uh, the messenger RNA, you can see right there, and so that's pretty much uh, what's going on. I like the way the book does. Uh, it gives you confirmation, at least. This is a really nice uh, transmission electron micrograph. They used, the, of course, the diamond knife and made a slice. And you can see it's beautiful. No, uh, You don't see any knife marks or anything. It's, it's really a very, very nice. I've really, because I've done TEM, uh, it makes me really uh, appreciate the, the uh, uh, the, the facility of somebody taking the time to do it right. And that's just a gorgeous picture. That's one of the best I've seen. Of course, that's why it's in the textbook, right? Now, the side of protein, this is the Golgi apparatus. This is the shipping department of the cell, the Golgi. The side of protein modification, so additional modifications can happen. Now, I worked for UPS once, one summer. Uh, I remember it very well. Uh, they sure get their money's worth out of you in about four hours, about all you could take. But anyhow, you bend things and you ship them. So things that go to a common area, of course, of states, we, we separate those and bend them for that state. It's kind of what goes on in the Golgi apparatus. It consists of several flat and disc-shaped sacs called cisternae. And I kind of view that as bends, always closely associated with the endoplasmic reticulum and transitional vesicles from the endoplasmic. So essentially, the uh, endoplasmic reticulum, the smooth ER, uh, is aligned right to the back door of the receiving end of the Golgi apparatus, which is the shipping department. So we move things to the back doors of the shipping department to be moved, uh, bend, and then shipped out the front side of uh, the Golgi apparatus. Really, it does kind of work like that. Proteins are modified within the cisternae by the addition of polysaccharides and lipids, so we're adding even more additional, maybe even uh, some of the things that didn't get to, let's say, treated for uh, uh, flame retardancy, it still could be added in the Golgi apparatus. It's whatever, uh, you know, it's been somewhat logically figured out um, by the cell and the, and the chromosome. The condensing vesicles pinch off the Golgi apparatus. Now the Golgi apparatus, what it says pinch off, and this is kind of, you know, it literally does, but there's a very important thing that's happening here. And the video that you uh, watched uh, with the inner life of the cell does show it uh, throughout. But what's really nice 
you know, when you go into a grocery store, they sort of expect you to bring your own uh, shopping bag, right? Uh, you don't want those plastics and that just adds to the trash and blah, blah, blah. And so the idea is it's you're recycling, you're reusing something over and over again. Well, that is really the amazing aspect of eukaryotic cells and, and prokaryotes in some ways. But uh, the phospholipid bilayer is that reusable kind of container. And so uh, we can just pinch off membranes and form this like shopping bag uh, and that has proteins and things all contained in it. And then it moves uh, by uh, the FedEx delivery guy, uh, literally, uh, to wherever it's going to go. But that bag or that container, that cardboard box, is a phospholipid bilayer. And then that can be reused no matter where it is in the cell because... Uh, uh, all of everything is made up of these phospholipid bilayers so you can meld wherever you want it to go it's it's just an amazing system it's something to really uh, to appreciate so here's the endoplasmic reticulum going into the uh, receiving uh, dock of the Golgi apparatus in the back door and then through the front door you can see things blebbing off these are phospholipid bilayers all this being is really technically a micelle, a very large micelle, and in it is embedded proteins in the membrane and free floating on the inside. So they're like little balloons. Now they've cut them open just so you can see, you know, kind of hafted, uh, so you can see the structure, which again, it's also misleading to think of it that way. So um, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and magically pretend. To see these things as sort of like uh, soap bubbles and no we won't go there it's okay uh, the idea is the phospholipid bilayer these are contained they're not open and they're floating around and they're moving uh, and then a very important thing happens is the FedEx delivery guy now takes these now if you saw in the movie there was something that had two legs moving across a nanotube well, that is the, F uh, the Fe Federal uh, or FedEx delivery guy. Uh, that is not a cartoon. That is actual. That's called, well, it's, a, it's got uh, two motors uh, that the legs are dienes, and uh, that's called a kinesian. And that uh, little thing that moves carrying the sack of one of these uh, with embedded freshly made proteins goes to anywhere within the cell and it knows where to go because that little uh, self-assembled uh, nanotube that's walking on uh, if you go back and re review the movie or if you recall it goes to wherever its destination is carrying very faithfully that uh, little uh, freshly formed uh, vesicle uh, and the kinesian just takes it where it needs to go isn't that an amazing system uh, to me, it's just it's just jaw dropping. So the nucleus endoplasmic reticulum Golgi apparatus is nature's assembly line. It is a business analogy totally applies. That you uh, in the nucleus, you come up with the designs, your CAD programs, you print them out. It goes out to the shop floor. The designers look at your your plans and then build it, whatever it is in the endoplasmic reticulum. We build it. Then we have to ship it wherever it's going to go, how it's going to be used. So we take it to the shipping department, the Golgi apparatus. Of course, we label it and it knows where to go. It has the labeling and bend and uh, vesicle forms. And then the Kinesian where the FedEx delivery guy takes it to wherever it's going to go. And that's pretty much everything that's uh, written here, uh, but in an analogy form. But that's what's going on. And it's, it's quite amazing to, to think of that. So here's pictorial process in a 2D sense. Now, again, this is sli sliced, so you see the openings of everything. Um, and I don't want you to get the wrong impression that it's not totally contained. That's why I like the uh, inner life of the cell so much better, because that shows you realistically what's going on. Now, one of the things that the authors will tell you is it's a lot more jam-packed with things that are going on it's a, a process that's really kind of uh, mind-blowing it, it, it's just so much it blinds you from what's seeing the big picture so 
that video kind of takes away some of the complexity it's not making up or making cartoons those things that you saw in the video were actually made from the electron microscopies and, and various other ways of visualizing what's going on and then they uh, made renderings of that uh, realistically as best they could so I think it's amazing but so you can see Miss Nucleolus is adjusting the timing and the amounts and all those things so she literally is or he uh, is controlling uh, all the resources of the cell and things are being made once they're going through the process it is a uh, sort of a line of things so it could uh, go from outside uh, I mean inside to outside being secreted in uh, it could be just features along the cell it could be anywhere within a cell where the the destination of the shipping so it's it's quite amazing and I hope you followed along on that we have some specialized other vesicles we have the uh, paper shredder which is the lysosomes contains a variety of enzymes uh, in the intracellular digestion of food particles uh, so we're constantly recycling participates in removal of cell debris of course that's what we want to do if you didn't do that then the cell would be sort of like you know my desk with just crap everywhere and eventually you do have to remove it and if something does get damaged you need to to clear away the damage and repair vacuoles are sort of the containment uh, it's like that little refrigerator you keep on your desk and that sort of thing membrane bound that carries uh, fluids or solid particles to be digested excreted or stored and it's just nice to have those storage facilities found in phagocytic cells in response to food and other substances that have been engulfed so it, it's sort of like temporary storage uh, the contents of the food vacuoles are digested to a merger of the vacuole with a lysosome. Uh, with a lysosome, a lysosome is some means body, so it's a body that lyses things, and so that's what the lysosomes uh, we just discussed. So. Uh, the whole process, engulfment of food, formation of food, vacuoles, and storage, and, and a lot of it is just temporary. And again, please view the inner life of the cell to see there's the kinesian, there's the freshly formed uh, material, a phospholipid bilayer or the vacuole, uh, a container uh, with, you can see all the embedded proteins and the, there's proteins floating on the inside of this but it's a big sack not like that open sort of diet cross section that you saw it, it this is what it's doing the kinesians walking along this uh, a, a nanotube that uh, spontaneously forms you can see them all over the place it's like highways and a little kinesian is taking it where it needs to go and again it's just amazing and if you get a chance now there's another one under here it's called Harvard protein packing and that shows you all the proteins that are being that have been made or various types and how uh, congested cells are with this so the next time you go around and you don't get enough to drink you can see that things get a little bit denser than you would like to have uh, and that's not a good thing because then the activity of some of those proteins or the enzymes won't work and then the headaches and soreness and bad things happen so the mitochondria let's talk about the mitochondria and let me zip forward here a sec uh, it's a sack within a sack and so what we have is this inner membrane and the uh, outer membrane and uh, the matrix so we have an inner side and an outside all I'm going to tell you so far as we get into this uh, is from the inside to the outside across here uh, this is a concentration gradient and of hydrogen and that is really the trick the secret of why we want this bag within a bag uh, because it forms a battery effect when you have a higher concentration of hydrogen versus the lower concentration that is a uh, a potential across that membrane and that's a battery and batteries can be used uh, to power my cell phone or that little cooling fan that I have on my desk uh, believe it or not uh, to making ATP which that's what mitochondria are really for uh, producing energy in the form of uh, chemical bond energy uh, ATP adenosine triphosphate so the chemical bond energy is in that phosphate bond 
uh, that can be used to do work, uh, shape change, and that sort of thing. But how all that happens and occurs is by an automated system, and I'm going to uh, show that to you uh, at some point, where the uh, little motor spins as a result of that battery effect. And when it spins, it's making a TP from a DP, an inorganic phosphate. And how it does it, it's enzymatically, but it's done on a revolving wheel type of thing. And that's the only way we can be that's sustainable to make enough energy to keep all the things that we do. And you can imagine the incredible amount of energy that we go through in, in a day. And this is done, uh, the only way to do that is by uh, it's just automating a billions and billions of these little machines called ATP centases and they spin and all they're doing is literally moving a DP and inorganic phosphate in such close proximity at the molecular level together the amount of energy it takes to build that ATP uh, or to get it back if you want to look at it that way is very very small comparatively to the energy that you get from it so this is this is an amazing aspect uh, of what's going on in a mitochondria so let's go back uh, it's composed of smooth continuous outer membrane within the inner folded membrane so that is where the battery is forming folds the inner membrane called Christi holds enzymes and electron carriers of aerobic respiration. So enzyme would be that ATP synthase, that's an enzyme, extracts chemical energy contained in the nutrient molecules and stores it as ATP. Well, that is for the general population, but for you, what it's actually happening is that we are charging up batteries uh, from uh, hydrogen, essentially within uh, the uh, mitochondria we break down various sugars and release energy hydrogen across the membrane and we charge up the inner part of the sac or the inside of the, the inner sac and with a higher concentration so as compared to the outer part it is a much higher potential and you get a battery effect hydrogen zip through to go to the other side because you know osmosis and that sort of thing and as the process of that intermittent or that temporary positive charge as it slips through, ATP synthase takes advantage of that positive charge and starts to spin this little uh, sort of uh, series of proteins and it spins just like a fan. And it has a stator which pushes two proteinaceous uh, subunits together and that's how we get the inorganic phosphate and uh, ADP to come in such close contact to make ATP and that is the true story what's going on it makes this boring uh, uh, just boiled down version it's, it's silly in comparison to really know it's what's going on with the ATP synthase so it's important so uh, has unique organelles divides independently of the cell of course the mitochondria are contain the circular and they have bacteria so that's how we know that the mitochondria are actually from bacteria and all we care about though is that it knows how to make atp and it does that by having these atp synthases embedded everywhere and uh, going across now it shows the ribosomes and all that for making the proteins and various things we have to have the energies to make the atp ATP synthases and all the other things that, that uh, the mitochondria have to do uh, but it's serving multiple functions we, we build the the ability to make more mitochondria in its replication and it just goes on and on it's an amazing story and in the video you could see that uh, these life forms the mitochondria move uh, they're not static. They're not sitting there. They're moving all over the place. So, you know, if you if you hold your breath and feel, you can feel them moving around in your cells. No, I'm just joking. I just grossed you out, but no, I didn't mean to. I just wanted you to think about uh, within the mitochondria. And so we're going to go and look at a mitochondria where these might be uh, in these uh, inside. You can see the biovisions of Harvard. That's where this was generated. And all these proteins floating around as we migrate through and all of a sudden we start to see some busyness going on and various things inside the cell and we see the uh, uh, the little factories forming and um, so we'll get 
into that uh, process a little bit more a little bit later endosymbiosis so there's broken down it's the process by which life forms together inside so it provides the best explanation chloroplasts are the of course the uh, the um, uh, using the power of the f uh, photocells I guess you could say uh, analogy for the mitochondria uses sort of like gasoline driven um, generators chloroplasts use solar cells and it's photosynthesis it's driven by photosynthesis and the, the very same chloroplasts that we see uh, in plants are used in uh, some of the eukaryotic cells that do photosynthesis and we'll talk about that but endosymbiosis is amazing and it's like they sat down and worked out an agreement and uh, we're still living up to that partnership so all it's just showing is that uh, somewhere along the line we made a deal that uh, why reinvent the wheel it's already there and so the prokaryotic sort of uh, became in uh, uh, built into ourselves and that's really so this is out of your book it's showing the same sort of thing and uh, showing that uh, somehow that that uh, um, endosymbiosis occurred and in the eukaryote and there we go so however you want to slice it and dice it that's uh, really all these slides are showing and so now that ATPase I know that you are waiting in suspense you see the rotation going on in there that is driven by the battery effect we have hydrogen zipping through momentarily being attracted you can see those little dots right there I have a pointer on it and the hydrogen as it goes through those are attracted that's what causes a rotational effect and then at the very top we have proteins that are moving inside there that uh, literally are making the uh, ATP DP uh, close closely associated with the inorganic phosphate to make ATP and the battery effect again just so that you're aware whenever you talk about a battery it is a concentration effect of charge and however that's achieved it could be with iron it could be all sorts of things but in cells it's hydrogen so if you have water and the original photosynthesis all that's happening in photosynthesis is you have light energy essentially cracking water so the antenna the chlor chlorophyll that's in plants pick up on that high energy it's been uh, somewhat filtered through the cell because you know we know green plants are green because it's green because that's what's being reflected it's being filtered so we get a perfect um, frequency of light that happens to resonate water and resonates water in such a violent pattern that the hydroxyl group and the hydrogen groups break apart and we get the hydrogen part and that uh, is the energy that we're grabbing for photosynthesis that stores of course uh, uh, in the form of ATP and then we have of course everyone um, dressed up in uh, specialized clothes uh, if you're following uh, in photosynthesis uh, and we have the uh, the night crew that comes in that actually in the Kelvin Klein clothes that they're wearing uh, the Kelvin cycle uh, make the cookies uh, so you have the energy during the day formed in the form of ATP because it cracked water from the sunlight and then uh, at night they make cookies or form the sugars in the plants and there that's photosynthesis well based on that same kind of concept it's a concentration we get a battery effect and there's the secret and so we have uh, the hydrogens that uh, zip through uh, which it, it's it's bi-directional you can spin it uh, whichever way based on the charge of the battery but it requires the higher concentration on one side of that membrane from the outer now that's why we have a bag within a bag uh, in the mitochondria so we have a difference in the hydrogen concentration and as the hydrogens go through uh, it gives you that momentary attraction to that positive charge and that starts to spin because it, there's essentially uh, no resistance uh, here it's fluid based and it's spinning as a result of that the subunits uh, we have 
ADP and inorganic phosphate held in uh, the embedded in these proteins and here's this, uh, the, the stator that pushes the two subunits together and forms ATP and it just does it on a routine uh, basis back and forth not just one but millions of these things are occurring with uh, I don't know 10 15 of those centers uh, embedded in the protein so every spin you're doing a huge number of ATP and you get billions and billions of these in, in embedded in the mitochondria's membranes so if your head hasn't exploded yet uh, this is how ATP is made and it, you didn't know you had a little uh, these nanomotors everywhere you got billions of these bacteria do the same sort of thing uh, so you, you think that uh, bacteria are stupid or something no they have the same kind of technology they just don't have all the fancy uh, you know it's like Lamborghini versus a Pinto but either way it, it, it does the trick and I hope that makes sense to you and so uh, it's all about uh, the formation of the hydrogen that drives the uh, ATP synthase and to make uh, ATP from ADP. And it's that momentary charge that causes that spinning. So you can imagine that uh, something is as, constant, as important as in like photosynthesis photosynthesis where I mentioned the sunlight cracking water to form uh, the hydrogen and then of course we have to deal with the oxygen radical and we pass the hot potato around with a series of proteins we're not going to go through all that but um, that's what we do uh, with the cytochrome uh, the electron transport chain and all that is to deal with the oxygen radicals after we crack water but the hydrogen is what we're actually after and that's what causes the charging of the battery and so there you go and that makes a really interesting design of a uh, look at those there's always a pair uh, uh, come in, in pairs of two and you can see ADP and inorganic phosphates come together and when they get in such close proximity it transfers a, a very small amount of energy is required at temperature the heat within the system itself and then uh, generates ATP and off it goes so it's quite amazing and it's a system that's uh, been around for eons and making uh, uh, ATP and I hope uh, at least you can see and appreciate that so the chloroplast found in algae and plant cells capable of converting energy from sunlight so it can crack uh, the water molecules to uh, charge up batteries to make ATP synthase and that's been around for a long long time um, the chloroplasts resemble the mitochondria but are larger and contain special pigments so that it can filter and do what tricks that it needs in order to get the the light to resonate to form uh, this, this resonance that breaks water literally breaks water apart resonation is an amazing process it stores it in these containment areas so where the water gets cracked is actually in these little granules and uh, it contains the little containments are like little reactors and because you wouldn't want that uh, having all those oxygen radicals running around we have to contain those sorts of things and uh, but they're little batteries and they kind of look like watch batteries if you think of it that way and that's what uh, makes the ATP synthase and then the Kelvin Klein uh, wearing uh, fact uh, the uh, staff or the uh, employees come in at night and make the uh, cookies based on the ATP and uh, incorporates the chemical bond energy in the form of sugars and glucose and there you go in less than two minutes you got the whole thing in photosynthesis but the real deal photosynthesis not this kind of cook up cookbook type stuff plants are not only organisms capable of photosynthesis cyanobacteria can photosynthesize slightly different resonance but that's okay it still does the same sort of thing dinoflagellates and kelp and blah 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 and resonance it's all about frequencies light is a frequency it 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 uh, each frequency and of course you see these colors because it's resonating with pigments uh, that are in your eye when you studied anatomy you, you, rods and cones and we know that uh, the cones had uh, certain pigments that when it resonates or frequency to a particular uh, frequency of let's say red or whatever uh, 
it starts to vibrate when it vibrates it fires a neuron and lets the brain know hey i just saw some red and blah 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 and that very involved process but it's all about that and resonance is a very big deal and uh, it makes up all of life uh, to really drive this taking water and cracking it into oxygen and hydrogen and uh, h2o and so this oxygen radical, oxygen is toxic, by the way, as you know. Um, I just go into any retirement home and ask, don't go over there, start touching their shin, but you notice it's hot. And that's because the blood stasis is starting to build up in the shin area because they're not getting around and walking as much as they should. And then you start creating a response against it because of the oxygen radicals and you get the tissue thickening and all the bad things that happen. But we've got to get rid of these oxygen radicals and that's a part of the process, electron transport chain and various things. And even in the process of handling the oxygen radicals, we can actually charge the battery even more so it's all about that and so again it's all about uh, uh, having the frequencies and resonance and all that sort of thing so ribosomes distributed throughout the cell scattered freely attached to rough endoplasmic we've already talked about that and appears on the inside of mitochondria and chloroplasts can be found in short chains of polyribosome size and structure. Large and small subunits of ribonucleoprotein, uh, that's a mouthful, ribonucleoprotein, so it's proteins and uh, RNA all kind of blended together. Uh, eukaryote ribosomes, ADS, a combination of 60 and 40, yes, I know that adds up to 100. But it's again, it's a migration pattern through a polyacrylamide gels, and we call it Spiegberg units. And so it's its effective size and shape that gets through that field and, and that uh, um, matrix of polyacrylamide. So that's how we measure it. Um, but it is important to know that the subunits are different sizes too. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking at 50S and 30S uh, in the uh, prokaryotes. So these come and clamp together on the messenger RNA and then that allows the transfer RNA, which I'll go ahead and show. Uh, the transfer RNA comes in to match the grouping of three, and this is, should be review of nucleotides. And if it's the anti-codon, so if you have, let's say uracil, which is a replacement for thymine, and it would bind to an adenine, and so uh, you have to have three of those kind of pairings to occur just right because the amino acid that's held, in other words, the technical term for that, the really hard to learn word, it becomes a charged transfer RNA. <laughs> so transfer RNAs that are charged means that it has an amino acid attached, the right amino acid attached to it based on the anti-codon sequence of the transfer RNA. And when it comes in close proximity, it gives up that amino acid and builds the uh, uh, protein chain as, we're, uh, as it goes along. And, and I'm sure you've already seen these sorts of things and the chains and that. But uh, there's the messenger RNA, the uh, ribosome clamps onto it, the two subunits. And then all of a sudden, just like a 3D printer, the protein um, uh, sequences uh, are, will start to emerge. And there it is. Uh, it's growing. That's the protein based on the three. Uh, you can see groups of three uh, within the structure and the transfer RNAs uh, going in, adding the amino acid to the chain that's building. And we go on. Isn't that just amazing? And it goes on. So the decoder ring is a transfer RNA. That is what's actually translating from the sugar system to the protein system. There's nothing like it anywhere else in the system that I'm aware of. If you know of one, please let me know. But there's the mature protein being sent out to do whatever it is. It may now associate with another one, uh, become a, uh, a quaternary structure or a tertiary structure based just a protein single, or if it associates with others, it's a quaternary structure like heme and has uh, all sorts of complex structures that are going on. So it's an amazing system. The cytoskeletal uh, system 
is uh, keeps uh, the cells from being smashed. It uh, sort of gives it its 3D shape. Uh, so it uh, helps anchor it, moves RNA. So it, it basically expands. It's like putting a little, uh, those little plastic peanut things so that it doesn't get compressed and allows the inner things to move around. And so we have actin filaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. Now these microtubules can also be the routing for the, uh, the little kinesians carrying the bags and new stuff, but I don't want your heads to explode. But the idea is it's sort of a, a highways, but also builds the infrastructures inside to keep the cell from getting smashed. And so you can look at the uh, microtubules, intermediate filaments, and microfilaments, and you can see uh, there's the building and uh, building and tearing down of those little microtubules uh, that are used for the roads for the uh, kinesians uh, it's quite amazing it's just every time i go through this it's it, i feel like a little kid in a candy store it's just amazing to see uh, all these things the picture drawing doesn't do it justice the 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 3d uh system that i showed you but you can identify uh all the systems here and then you can see the intermediate filaments kind of building the uh um, the, the staging or the inside, but the 3D drawings that uh, 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 Michael Astrakhan at, uh, at Zyvo, uh, amazing man, amazing man, uh, drew these things and to uh, reflect what was actually shown in uh, electron microscopy at Zyvo and provided these amazing uh, video images that we enjoy. But there is the scaffolding that you see inside the cell that gives it that uh, X, Y, and Z shape and structure and things can matriculate around it, uh, matriculate, uh, move in and around and all that sort of stuff. And as you can see, so that's the cytoskeleton. I hope at least this view, if you've ever had that, uh, well, how does this all work? The, the way the book describes it is extremely boring and uh, doesn't do it much justice. So um, there you go. It's uh, in the video here. And so let me end this segment. Uh, so I've covered 4.1, 4.2, and I'm going to leave 4.3 for another video. But uh, you can see uh, sort of a uh, synopsis of all the features that we've talked about. And uh, I threw in another topic here, your book did actually, I was just uh, trying to make myself look good. Uh, the viruses don't have, there's a bunch of minus symbols because, well, you know what? It's a pirate. So it takes over the cells that have all these things. Viruses are extremely lazy. And really all it's bringing to the table is are the instructions. And it says, the heck with your instructions. I'm going to take those uh, over the cell and you're going to build what I tell you to do it. Well, it, you know, holds you... Um, at uh, distress. So anyhow, uh, unless I digress, we'll be covering viruses in chapter six, which isn't that far away. So we got uh, three and four, and we got five and then six. We get man, we're moving right along. Uh, so before you know it, we're going to be talking about final exams and things like that. But uh, anyhow, uh, please uh, refer to this chart. Be able to uh, just sort of summarize. Uh, the characteristics of bacteria and eukaryotes based on this uh, graph here, and this would be a good thing. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, segment. Some of this may be new to you. Some of it may be old hat. I don't know. But the inner life of the cell really does help uh, the, the true understanding of what's going on in the cell. And um, I'll be uh, getting back with you on the goals for the next one. Uh, uh, 4.3 and talk about fungi and the fungal anatomy and uh, heterotrophs and all those sorts of good things. I'll talk to you then. Take care. Be safe.